Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Philosophy Show. My name is Tegan Marshall, and I'm here with Michael Robert Cadets. We're in for an exciting show tonight. It's going to be a very freeform show tonight. Um, we're just going to shoot from the hips, as they say in the old Western films, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so, Mike, why don't you say hi to our audience this evening? Hi to our audience this evening. Yes, I'm excited about our uh, freeform show. We we're gonna we're gonna uh, since there's only two of us and uh, neither of us consider ourselves to be experts on the plan topic, social media and society. I have a couple things I can say about it. Maybe we'll include that. But I'm thinking in general, we're just gonna kind of wander on whatever topics come up, and we're gonna test our true philosophical knowledge indeed we're gonna be we're gonna be like Nietzsche in the uh, God is dead parable where he says he wanders he wanders aimlessly crying out to the people hoping that they would recognize the truth of the event that's occurred will you be the voice in the wilderness we'll find <laughs> out <laughs> All right, so in true freeform fashion, we might as well just begin with some basic conversation. Um, maybe we'll even touch on some. Well, actually, seeing as Mikey brought up social media, why don't we talk about social media? If you didn't know about our social media, we have a YouTube channel, we have a Facebook page, and we're working on creating a creating a website as we speak still in development our facebook is the canadian philosophy show feel free to like us there and our youtube as well the youtube you'll be watching on right now um please subscribe to that and uh, if you find find this show helpful in any way uh, please share that around so we can build our audience and before we get into it we want to thank the radio stations that carry our program um, the VIU Vancouver Island University radio station out of Nanaimo, British Columbia, CHLY, um, 101.7 FM, and SFU's radio station, Mikey. Um, why don't you thank them tonight? Yeah, CJSF. I forgot the acronym. CJSF 90.1. That's the SFU so, station. And we're looking for a new station, so hopefully we're going to grow and grow. Anyway, we have two great stations that carry us, and we do our best to offer uh, meaningful, uh, informative, philosophical content coming from mainly from undergraduates. We want to prove that undergraduates aren't uh, aren't ignorant. Um, although I'm a graduate, but I'm uh, but I'm not ignorant either. <laughs> so, no, we yeah, have a great indeed. bunch. Tegan, I'm impressed with how smart you are, and I can't wait to hear. What you're going to say today about uh, social media? Because I have a couple things to say. So, but I'll let you. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you start. Lay lay out the groundwork. Excellent. Social media, the wild west of the internet, where words get said and retractions are not often made. So you may be asking, yeah, we know that about social media, you know, it can be it can be a great way to connect, it can be a great way to foster relationships, but more often than not, we see the negatives of social media. Um, and so the philosophical question becomes, right, how does social media impact society? What does social media do? in the forming of individual minds and individual hearts. Uh, because I would argue that part of our logos is not only just speech and reason and the ability to intellectually um, understand things, but part of logos is also to develop feelings and emotions towards things. And so how might that work with social media? Well, you know, I can only speak from my own experience and the experiences that we all have documented. Um, but before we, before we get there, um, I guess I'll ask Mikey this question to, to lead in. 
Um, what inspired you to start your social media accounts? The promise of uh, connection with people, of being able to mm -hmm. create a persona to get followers, to join me in my projects. Fascination with technology. I've always been fascinated with technology. <clears throat> when I was a kid, I uh, bought one of the uh, one of the uh, first computers that was available for home use. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. When I was a kid, they were just coming out with uh, with with personal computers. So I've always been fascinated with technology, and and social media is more than a technology. It's a whole world. And uh, it just is, is has always been fascinating to me. Of course, now I'm growing skeptical about as various aspects aspects of it, and I'll talk about that during the course of the uh, show. What my skepticism is. Right. Right. I think I think you said something very interesting, Mikey. This idea of a persona to 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 get followers right and this gets into a very existential question right and existentialism i think sometimes gets a bad rap because it's considered to be the you know the cheesy you know kind of philosophy class right because that's what everyone thinks philosophy is right is it's like what is the point of my existence and yeah that's definitely part of it but you know it's it's also personal relationships it's also you know how do we respond to people in authority right how how do we deal with laws and and morality and stuff like that so it's far more than just your standard why do i exist even though that's a very valid question which i think every philosopher um spends the majority of his life pondering even if he thinks he's found the answer i mean you you look at you look at you know saint augustine right when he wrote in the confessions and city of god about how even though god for him was the answer right there was still more to be explored because why why does that pursuit take place right or how does that how does that meaning deepen how does that purpose grow and develop um, but that but that's a that's a sidebar but i think it's a good sidebar so when we talk about the existential question right the existential question is who are you in the reality who is the authentic mikey who is the authentic tagan and i hate to tell you i don't fully know um <laughs> i'm still trying to discover that and so i think mikey it's interesting because the the question that i'll pose to our viewers and to you is and I think it's a conversation that we can have is does social media actually allow an individual to truly be themselves? And is that necessary for an actual personal relationship to develop? What do you think? Social media gives an opportunity for people to reinvent themselves, mm. to create a persona, to manipulate through a sort of personal marketing, manipulate their public image, mm. the impressions people have of them, to live out fantasies, to be the person that uh, somebody always wanted to be but maybe couldn't accomplish it until social media came along so that could be a positive thing i'm a bit skeptical because let me tell you an anecdote tell me 
Speak to me. So this 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 is an anecdotal uh, case of uh, where I would say social media and this persona that people create mm-hmm. online might interfere with actual personal relationships, which is one of the questions uh, at hand. So I don't fly. I haven't flown on an airplane in many years. And although I haven't traveled much during COVID, my trips over the last decade have been driving in a car. Yeah. Cross country, cross North America, cross the US, cross Canada. And it's sort of an ongoing joke I have uh, with uh, um, a couple of good friends that when I travel through cities where a lot of my Facebook friends live, they suddenly disappear when I'm traveling through their town. So, you know, this is anecdotal and it's not, you know, I haven't done, you know, scientific research about this and I'm conceding that. But it seems to me that many of my Facebook friends over the years who are very, very much in you know, we're, we're very, we're, we, we, we connect all the time, maybe every day. And then quite often when I say, Hey, I'm on a trip, I'm going to be in, uh, your town, Centerville next week. Suddenly I don't hear from them. They disappear. It happens quite a bit. And, and so my theory is, is that many people on social media for whatever reasons, I have some theories about the reasons, but they prefer to keep their interaction to social media only and not in person maybe it's safety maybe it's uh, emotional safety or physical safety but i i think it's because people create a whole new persona on social media that doesn't it it doesn't um sync well with 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 a physical in-person life and so if to the extent they have a physical in-person life they keep that separate and and it's and it's creates some sort of cognitive dissonance or conflict between Mm -hmm. two worlds, the social media world and the in-person world with your close friends and family that you actually Mm -hmm. get together with physically. And, and so that, that part bothers me. That part bothers me because I I never, you know, intended to use social media as a substitute for my personal relationships or, and I never intended to use it as a sort of a second life as a, as a uh, fantasy life. Right. I, I think, I think you just hit on a really um, good point, Mikey, where this idea of a second life, right? This idea of the idealized existence that we could have. You know, I think this is more apparent when we talk about platforms like Instagram uh, versus versus something like Facebook. Because Instagram, you have the photos, you have the filters. You're able to, in a sense, doctor the life that you have to make it look like it's life you want. And when you speak of cognitive dissonance, or maybe not even just cognitive dissonance, but the inability to separate fact from fiction, fantasy from reality. Um, I'm I sympathize with you Mikey because I um do uh, presentations on occasion on with as, as it pertains to the anti-human trafficking movement within our country And one of the one of the aspects that I often will speak about when there is young women in the room 
trying to reemphasize their value as young women and their value as them because more often than not in in human trafficking situations we we see these young women be romanced we see them you know be showered with gifts and attention and stuff like that which which they may not receive in their other relationships and and so something like social media where where this happens quite often uh, we we see the dark side of social media I mean, I don't mean to slam social media up against a wall, but but these are kind of the harsh realities of when we use social media as an avenue for connection, because not all connection is good connection. Um, another another story that comes to mind is, and it will get lighter, I promise, but. You know, here on this show, we don't just deal with the lucky charms and the rainbows, um, unfortunately. Uh, is a case we're all pretty familiar with. Uh, actually, we won't talk about that. But what what I'm trying to say is that even when it's not a human trafficking scenario, like it's a cyberbullying scenario, we see that there is a disconnect between the profile and the person who created the profile. There's no longer a recognition that there is a person behind the profile. An actual human person that has thoughts and feelings and goals and aspirations, which is dramatically affected by the response of social media. So this raises an interesting question in terms of in terms of social media and its uses. Um, in terms of there being both a proper use and an improper use. And I think the the important thing to realize is that Not not only is what you do on social media permanent, but what you do on social media has more of an effect on individuals than you may realize. And so I I would I would suggest that social media is a neutral medium. And it is up to every individual to determine how they manipulate that medium. What, what, what do you say? Do you agree or do you disagree or are you somewhere in the middle? Well, I don't agree that it's neutral, um, which uh, leads me to my next point of skepticism. Uh, and it's more of a political economic um, issue so I'll explain that Tegan um, so social media arises primarily out of a global capitalistic market driven to a great extent by the United States not exclusively but for, to a great extent the United States so social media exists in a capitalist context it's profit driven the the uh, the companies that do the R and D and the the um, implementation that maintain the social media sites are driven by profit, and so they're constantly looking for ways to make money, and that has led to what I think are some pretty negative uh, uh, ramifications and one is the surveillance 
So this is corporate surveillance on individuals. So in return for individuals signing up for their free accounts on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all that, the corporations which uh, own those platforms, they mine data. They mine your and my personal data. And uh, to varying degrees and with certain you know, supposed safeguards, which I think are questionable, whether they're very effective, they, you know, they, they, they sell it uh, to, uh, to, to, to buyers, and that's how they make money. And um, now one can imagine, in contrast, a social media platform that developed in a non-profit-driven, uh, let's say, public sector. So uh, imagine hypothetically a, a more socialist or communist or some other type of um or or even a you know a primarily capitalist society where where the where the public infrastructure the public sector develop a social media platform and i dream about that i dream about about that as being um overcoming many of the problems of uh possibly overcoming some of the problems of uh profit driven social media imagine if uh if a, if a country or multiple countries said as a matter of public policy, we're going to establish a public sector social media platform and it's going to be governed by, uh, pu by policies which uh, reflect privacy, individual rights, freedom of speech. I'm just wondering what could be done with that. So, so yeah, so I, I'm I'm concerned about the 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 fact that um that social media is so um, how would you say so um, efficacious? Devices. Yeah, well, no, it's it's so it's it's so ingrained. It's so it re the ramifications of social media, whether it comes to creating a persona, whether it comes to human trafficking, if it comes to uh, to to speech, to promoting misinformation or promoting correct information. It's so um, we're so intimately tied. Our lives and our society is are so intimately tied to social media. It bothers me that it exists in the private sector, where where, where the motive is profit. That so that concerns me. Um, I realize that I've actually spoken out a term of my own convictions as well. Actually. Um, my brain is functioning at half capacity, but such is the life of a student. Um, but hey, it's worth it, right? Social media is highly political. And you know why that is? Because we're political animals. And so... As Aristotle points out, the human ability to reason, the human ability of logos, makes us rational. That that makes us rational creatures is also going to make us engage in conversation. And my, I don't know enough about how social media runs in the private sphere to make any kind of real comment there. I I think there is um I think in some senses there is an argument to be made that social media within the private sphere allows possibly for there to be greater diversity I, I, but I also see your point of having it governed by the public sphere ensures that there is not necessarily this amount of whether it be misinformation or targeting of groups or something to that nature. I, I think, um, I think there's a lot that could be said on social media. I, I think. I think um, to tie this to COVID times, to tie this to um, life events, right? 
we we in BC we have just gone through uh you know we're seeing closure of indoor dining right now um thankfully patios are still open so go support local business <laughs> but um I think it's interesting because through this whole pandemic socialization for people myself included has been an interesting experience because as much as zoom it exists as much as facebook video calls exist it does not make up for face to face interaction and i think social media has kind of numbed us to the value of face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think it goes back to my earlier point of it numbs us to the reality that people are people. And, and it's so easy to jump into a political discussion and say, how could you think that way, you idiot? You know, but, but but what we often forget is that there's another person at the end of of our keyboard strokes and so i think i think there there comes a question of okay even within the public sphere how do we how do we increase dialogue um while maintaining a peaceful dialogue because I think you and I could both agree that, you know, well, <laughs> when a politically charged argument happens on Facebook, that's no longer a peaceful, productive dialogue. I think it's important to recognize the distinction between social media and electronic conferencing platforms. So something like Facebook or Instagram it's quite a different beast than Zoom or, you know, Cisco WebEx or whatever the video conferencing platforms are. They're, I mean, they're related in that they're electronic, but, you know, the latter examples are not really social media platforms. Um, when you're on a Zoom call, when you're doing what we're doing now, um, we're actually not on Zoom, we're on another platform, but... Uh, we have a lot more information than mm. than 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 you have from a Instagram or a Facebook profile. I mean, we have a lot more verification in this case that you know you're an actual person and you're authentic, and I'm an actual person and I'm a man and, and I'm I, I'm who I claim to be. The problem with uh, social media profiles is that uh, you don't really know for sure whether the person behind the profile is who he or she claims to be and that and that opens the door for a lot of abuse and then so it can be difficult to navigate uh social media in that um you you have to try and sort out what's authentic and what's fake and it seems like it's gotten harder to do that as mm -hmm. the fake people who have all kinds of motives whatever they might be money or spreading misinformation you know, R Russian Russian agents uh, promoting uh, misinformation, or um, it, it's hard to navigate that. And uh, you know, on a Zoom call or something, we're just using sense extenders to communicate with people, and we have pretty decent ways of verifying that they're they're they are actual human beings there, right? I I'm it's reasonable for me to assume that you're an actual human being, Tegan. I've actually never met you in person, by the way. Tegan and I have never met in person. In physical person, we've only communicated over electronic media, not social media, but electronic electronic media. And if we go way back, first <laughs> communication we ever did was by this thing called email. I don't know if anyone uses that anymore, but you know, who was I to know who Michael Robert Kaditz was when he when he slid into my inbox by virtue of my chair of the philosophy department. I was like, okay, this dude says he's the VIU graduate. 
and says he wants to do this thing. So let's do it. And then Mikey and I met on a Zoom call. I was like, okay, he is a person. <laughs> this is good. Not just some random, you know, robot. But, you know, that's me just joking around a little bit. But, yeah, I think social media. I think the reason I just brought in the video call, Mikey, was because Facebook does video calling services. So, so that's the only reason I brought that in. But I see what you're saying, that by virtue of telecommunications, we we have more, and you know, we have more checks and balances that way. That you know, I'm not actually, you know, I don't know, Ted from San Francisco. You know what I mean? It's 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 more, it's more reasonable to believe that I am Tegan who on Vancouver Island uh, than than not. Um, yeah, but I think. Um, this, unless you have something other to 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 uh, to say about that. Well, th this is sort of a further development of the topic. Uh, I've been thinking recently about uh, whether we are um, um, evolving uh, pretty quickly into a post-physical world. So, uh, we, you know, one of the we've come full circle because some of the early um, Western philosophers consider the proposition that uh, that uh, uh, humans are actually, or that I am, I think, uh, did, uh, did Descartes talk about this, that I could just be a brain in a vat. I, you know, I could not actually have a physical being. I, I could be a brain, you know, making up or imagining, um, you know, this, this physical world around me. And uh, so I'm thinking now, and, and what got me thinking was, was this COVID pandemic and how people are doing um, online telemedicine, you know, medical appointments online and, 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 we're finding all kinds of ways to accomplish things without physically meeting up with people um, that we didn't know were possible. It was always assumed that, you know, if you if you need to get medical care, you got to go to the doctor's mm -hmm. office. But now um, there's there's many many types of of, uh, of um, conditions or ailments or, or um, uh, complaints that patients can have that can be addressed. Uh, we're finding out um, online through through a you know t phone call or a Zoom Zoom call. And I'm wondering if, if, if you combine that with, with social media and the way we can create personas, I'm wondering if we're, if we're moving toward a, uh, a post-physical world where you almost don't even need your physical body anymore, except to support your brain. Um, <laughs> but then you, we could develop technology that would support brains without the rest of the body. So now I'm getting now I'm getting into into the abstract, but it may be an interesting way to go here um, because. Uh, Tegan, because uh, imagine um, that that we could be moving, you know, over the next number of decades or centuries oh, or something to, to a place where where we no longer need our physical bodies. Uh, we, all we need is our brains because because the physical world is irrelevant and it doesn't it, the, the the overhead is too high and there's no need anymore uh -huh. to transport <laughs> yourself from one place to another. You don't need to go to another physical place because you can do everything electronically. So we can use, uh, you know, um, uh, we can use sense extenders in the in the form of uh, headphones and microphones and, and computer monitors uh, uh, in a much more efficient way than actually transporting oneself to a different part of the world or a different part of the city. So why why do we even need our bodies? <laughs> we just need to find some way of supporting our brain, our, our brains. Oh man! Oh, what do you think? Well, Is that kind of mind boggling? It's disturbing. It's just straight up disturbing. I mean, it's fascinating and yet disturbing. Uh, <laughs> well, look at the, the cost of having bodies. I mean, the, this virus, this, uh, you know, the, the, no, the no, coronavirus and all kinds of disease yeah. that humans have been suffering with for, you know, ever since the, you know, the advent of humanity. Uh, we can overcome that by simply dispensing with our bodies. So what we need to do... I'm obviously arguing tongue in cheek. I'm not sure I like the idea, but I may, I'm being empirical. I mean, maybe maybe this is where we're going. Maybe we're going to a place where we we discover incrementally, just as we've discovered that you don't actually have to show up in the same room as somebody in order to have a relationship with the person. And now we're discovering you don't have to go into a doctor's office 
uh, in many cases to get a diagnosis for physical conditions. Maybe we're moving to a place where our bodies are just uh, uh, high overhead and, uh, and, and a point of weakness and vulnerability. And what we really need, all we really need is our, is our minds in order to create personas. What do you think? See, we're running into a dualism-based argument here, uh, in a sense, because for anyone who's not familiar with the Car Cartesian dualism, dualism is the idea that that our our body is merely kind of a vessel of transport. Um, our our body is the housing unit for who we truly are, which is, which would be our immaterial soul or whatever you would like to call it. But I'm going to take a bit of a, and it's going to be really rough, but there you go. I'm going to take a bit of a natural law, St. Thomas Aquinas perspective here. And say that in order to be fully human, a human must have a body. In order to fully experience what the human existence is, both good and bad, the body is necessary. Because it is within the body that we, we know what pleasure is. It, it's, it's nothing to do with our personality. Um, that we physically experience pleasure. Um, but, but it is an interesting question, right? If can we transfer human consciousness? But the very, the very idea of consciousness, which is within the brain, but the brain requires a, a body as far as we, 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 we understand, obviously. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely an interesting question, and it's definitely a more. Uh, I think that we should do a sh we should <laughs> we we should we should do a full on show on it at some point, and I can then brush <laughs> up my I can then brush up my uh, natural law theory a little bit. I can then we can have a full scale debate you and I on this a little more. Okay, well, we can have a small scale one now. So, uh, natural law theory uh, comes out of religion. We know that. Uh, you know, uh, there. You know, Aquinas and his, his natural law theory is an attempt to to support and justify uh, religion without specifically saying relig using religious terms. The medieval philosophers, I'm sure you've learned this, Hagen, ran a parallel track where. Uh, they they tried to build uh, philosophical uh, justification uh, and and arri to arrive at the same conclusions that the faith based uh, uh, churches of the time um, arrived at uh, it, it, as a way of uh, one appealing to non religious people uh, and also supporting religion by um, attempting to demonstrate that there is rational justification for uh, for, for faith-based uh, beliefs. But anyway, natural law theor theory, I'm saying, is highly religious because it imputes a value, uh, a goodness, uh, some sort of intrinsic value to, uh, to what you said was uh, the, the, what it is to be human, the human experience. But, but is there really any intrinsic value to that? I mean, it seems like you have to be religious to believe there is. You have to be religious to believe that 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 uh, there's an intrinsic value to humanity. That that is some so, sort of religious so, belief. So, so, Mikey, does your life not matter? Now we're see. This is this is where I wanted to go because we're going to go to existentialism here. Does it okay. matter? Right. So, does it matter to whom? To to, to me? Um, yeah, it matters to me. Does it matter to any any any? But, does it matter but, to a god or to the but, earth or to the rocks or to the universe? But, but but does it matter objectively? Yeah, does it matter objectively? I would have to say no. I think I think subjectively it matters. It matters to to me and maybe to other people if there are if there are other people, um, in their in their minds, uh, 
you know, so, I, I matter, but w- objectively... Warning to, war, war, warning to our listeners here, this may seem a little dark, but Mike and I are friends, so we can get away with this. So, if if someone who didn't know you had no, had no reference whatsoever of who you were, you know, what you stood for, came up and murdered you, what you would that matter? Well, it wouldn't matter to me because I'd be dead. Uh, so yeah, but but then why should it matter to anybody else? Well, that's the yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and and then and a, and a corollary, corollary to that is, uh, does anyone really matter to anybody, or is it just your image of them that matters? So, so if I have a loved one, uh, right. uh, what I have. You know the way I look at it in my mind, right? I have an experience of this of a person, and right. the physical being. If I ever meet that physical being, rather than just interact over social media, <laughs> yeah, that that's that 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 gives me sensory information, which feeds my image, my representation of that person in my head. So do I really love a person? One can argue that I'm not loving the person; I'm loving the representation of that person in my own mind. We're we're See, like getting, we're getting into the big questions of philosophy in this one one hour show, which is great, you know. We're but do we actually experience I mean, anything outside but, of ourselves? You see the problem because because if 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 your life doesn't matter to anybody, if your life doesn't objectively matter, then we have to question social movements because. <laughs> Because if your life doesn't matter, why advocate? Why why advocate for for rights? Well, why I didn't say all freedom? I said was it doesn't matter objectively. But maybe we can advocate for human rights right. on the basis of subjective value. Right. As long as we admit that I, it's subjective. But I mean that's that's a longer form discussion we won't have right now cuz <laughs> We're we're ticking down on time here, but I mean, I'm proud of us. We 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 at least brought one controversial issue into the show tonight. But I think I think what what I would say, um, because this goes into my personal relationship course I'm taking right now, is. What defines a close personal relationship? So, let me break that down for you real quick, Mikey, and then I'll see if you have any thoughts. Because in the book I'll be referring to, or the author I'll be looking looking towards, is Hugh LaFollette and his book, Personal Relationships, Love, identity, and morality. And what Lafayette presents is the following. The relationship you and I have with our auto mechanics, our bank tellers, and our grocery store clerks are strictly impersonal. Because the relationship strictly exists to serve the purpose of a means to an end. That's that's the only purpose of the relationship. A close relationship, a close personal relationship, however, is a relationship in which the relationship exists because um, because you 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 want to have a relationship with that person as they are for who they are. And and La Follette also makes the distinction of he actually uses Aristotle to describe the different types of friendship. The the complete friendship, the friendship of utility and the incomplete friendship. The complete friendships and the incomplete friendships. A complete friendship, which we can only have so many of, is where 
you desire a relationship for that person, recognizing who they are as an historical embodied creature. So not just the not just because you know I may re- I may desire you know a friendship with Mikey because he's a cool dude or he has you know philosophical knowledge. But if that's it, it's not a close personal relationship. What would make it a close personal relationship is if I hung out with Mikey and I really got to know Mikey and really started to say, okay, uh, Mikey's interested in, you know, renewal on article on renewable energy. And so I started to have a conversation with him about that. And maybe, you know, down the road, we, we go into business together and whatever. But, but that's what makes that close is because I am investing time and energy into Mikey because I like Mikey for who he is, not just the traits he possesses. And so the, the question, the question then becomes, you know, if if I th- where was I going with this? Um, you know, I think it's an interesting question in terms of your life matters to say someone like your significant other because they love you for who you are. Not because of necessarily what you can do for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So to bring us back to social media and the second life idea, Kagan, answer me this. If I grant you everything you said about friendships and the different kinds of friendships, why does it matter whether the person that you're having one of those types of friendship with is an actual physical person or if it's just a persona on social media that with maybe no actual human being under underlying? Why does it matter? If you can have the same experience, if you believe you're building a relationship with a person but you've never actually touched that person. You've never actually confirmed that person's existence by touching their body um, or by, you know, hearing them speak yeah. without sense extenders. If it's a if it's a persona that you relate to on social media, and you're and you're having the same experience because you believe it's an actual person, then why does it matter if it's not? Because it goes both ways. The person must also invest in you. Hmm. So it, must it's for what? Must for what? If if you if you believe the person's investing in you, and you're investing right. in that person, and it's actually not a real person, and now we can even question what real is anymore. Does real entail? Does is is it sufficient? Is a is an electronic persona sufficient? to be a real person if let's say that it's not let's say that there's a distinction between a, a persona on social media versus a physical thing made of matter over here although social mm-hmm. media is made of matter right it's, <laughs> it's still matter it's I, I you know what i'm saying that the distinctions are getting blurred <laughs> what's the distinction between the traditional human being you know matter in the form of a human body versus matter in the form of Electromagnetic waves. That's matter. Isn't it? The distinction I think is the the fact that it has the ability to rationalize and to to verbalize that idea of logos as an embodied being who is able to experience and grow and develop from experiences. See this raises have you ever seen Star Trek? I have, yeah, various iterations of it. Yeah. Have you seen Have you seen the one with Patrick Stewart and it's the Next Generation and there's Commander Data in there? I think I have, but I don't remember the details. Right. 
So remember that Commander Data is technically an android. But all throughout the series, Commander Data is fascinated with the uniquely human experience. So he desires to develop a way to, to have feelings, to have emotions, right? Because there's even an episode where Data goes to trial and there's debate on whether Data should be tried as an android or as a human being. And this is interesting because we have things like Amazon smart speakers. We have things like Sophia the Robot, if you've ever seen Sophia the Robot. Stuff like that. What makes us distinctly unique from any kind of robotic or electronic life form is our ability to to experience emotions and articulation and have experiences. Yeah, but with, with, go ahead. Yeah, but now you're the one who seems to be suggesting dualism, because um, it, because this uniqueness you're talking about, the unique un, unique ability to have emotional experiences, if it's really so unique, that suggests a um, an immaterial quality that humans have on the other hand if if you're not suggesting dualism then you should be um, accepting that these quote-unquote unique human experiences our emotional states our conscious states our, our qualia our experiences that they're nothing more than um, physical in which case if they're physical then in theory we can replicate those by manufacturing artificial and intelligent artificially intelligent beings but see we run back to your question mikey what makes those experiences real <laughs> yeah and, and i i'm 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 think it's all blurred now i think i think we're moving toward a world where the dis traditional distinctions between the physical and the non-physical, between the in-person versus electronic, wh where those things are going to get blurred, and uh, and it's not clear anymore. And um, well, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know. As long as we're alive, it won't be that way, because we will be able to remember the before time. We'll, we'll be able to remember what life was like when we could hug each other. We'll remember what life was like when we could go to parties, dinner, socials, right? I think, I think where that line finally disappears is when there's a generation that no longer understands what it's fully like to be in community. But, but even so... I don't think that'll ever happen. I th I think I think we're we're kind of looking at like a 1984 type vibe right now. Uh, you know, uh, a a futuristic novel, and I think I I would be interested to look at some psychological research and see see what's up because I there there's no clear cut rebuttal to what you just said. I have a, a couple other more um, provocative statements up my sleeve in our last couple of minutes. <laughs> uh, I want I want you uh, I'd like you when you get a chance and any of our uh, listeners if they're interested to. Google uh, the Scientific American article. Uh, oh yes. On, on on the question of do we live in a simulation? Chances oh, are about yes. fifty fifty, according to this guy. But this is in Scientific American, which immediately tells me there's got to be some credibility. <laughs> but it, but it was also published on April first, guys. So. Oh, know. October thirteenth, twenty twenty. 
That's the date of the yeah. article. I'm looking at it. Um, oh, article. okay. Yeah. But, but, there, but there was a later article that said we yeah. live in a simulation. Confirmed. No, well, no this, is a, this one is by uh, Anil Ananthaswamy, October 13, 2020, Scientific American. There's no time to read it all now, but he makes a, a, you know, a case for how we de might just be living in a simulation, uh, in a simulation someone's running a computer program and we, and we exist in this computer program so that's an interesting concept and See, then I have, now yeah now we have to take the classic cartesian rebuke <laughs> your ability to think mikey unless the counter to that is but couldn't the person just be programming your thoughts to be like well i'm thinking so therefore Therefore, it's not a simulation, but the thing is, but they could be programming your thoughts. But continue. Yeah, so I, I don't have anything more to say about that, but I wanted to say something else that, that has been on my mind. Um, Tell me. That kind of brings us into the expansiveness of the Twilight Zone here. So, <laughs> so Tegan, we, we often wonder about like all the people that weren't born. Uh, <laughs> I mean, think about think about how many people there are and how many people there are not. There's a lot more people that never were born than there are people that were born. There's an infinite number of people that were never born. There's an infinite number of events that never happened. There's an infinite number of worlds that never existed. <laughs> what, what we experience are just this very limited, you know, number of events that actually occurred, that transpired. Are you following me? I mean... We, yeah. we have no, yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll say to someone who's alive, like, God, what if your parents didn't meet? What if my, what if my parents never met? I wouldn't be born. I wouldn't exist. Well, <laughs> think about all the people that that's the case. They don't exist because their parents didn't meet. Think about the people that don't exist because my mother met my father rather than some other guy. So now there's all these people that don't exist. So I'm going to propose something because we wonder oftentimes about death, you know, like what is death? And uh, I'm going to suggest here that death is non-existence in that same way. So once you die, once you die, y you are nothing more than a non-existent being that was never born. Now, obviously, you know, religious people and all that are going to deny that. They're going to argue with, they would argue with my proposition. Um... And, you know, living people might have a recollection of you and you have a reputation and you have a legacy. We've done a show on legacy. But. Check it out. But, yeah, but, but, but. Your legacy, your reputation, your accomplishments, they exist only in the minds of living people. But you are no better and nothing more than someone that was never born. How's that for, a like, a mind-boggling concept? Well... There you go. And to that I say, a, me uh, a mental mori. Remember death. Um, <laughs> all right. So with that in mind, whoo boy, what a show. All right. Well, there you go. And this has been the Canadian Philosophy Show. A lively discussion indeed. Everything from a discussion of the morality and and value of human life to do we live in a simulation. I hope you'll join us again next week as we tackle another fantastical topic. Like I said, I'm here with my co-host and technical producer, Michael Robert Kaditz. I'm Tegan Marshall. Thank you to CHLY and... Um, CJSF. CJSF. For being our, 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 loyal, uh, our loyal broadcasters... The, and 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 you will be remembered when we become big and famous and we're carried all over the world. You will be the first two. <laughs> big <Thanks>. goals, <laughs> but one day at a time. All right, take it Thanks, easy, Dagan. everyone. <laughs> Bye now.